our mind is a prediction engine. So we constantly try and predict the outcome of every single moment. And most people uh, are, are in a situation where everything's predictable. So they're comfortable. And, and when you can't predict something and, and it doesn't align with what your mind expects in reality, we produce something called free energy. And free energy is the root of all, all fear. It's like the fuel for fear. And the way that we keep from producing free energy is if we start to take control over things that we have in, in um, our sphere of influence and let go of everything else that we don't. Episode 75, Are You a Mouse or a Lion? What's up, guys? Michael Bullock, host, founder of the Man of Mastery podcast. As you know, one of the things I love to explore on this show is the process of success, what that process looks like and how it involves failure. Failure is not the opposite of success. Mediocrity is the opposite of success. And I'm convinced that what keeps so many people stuck rooted in the mediocre and the average is fear, fear of failure. But what's fear? Fear really is just the knowledge gap between the known and the unknown. And as today's guest likes to say, everything that you want and deserve, happiness and fulfillment and peak performance and success, your future, it lies on the other side of fear, something we have to understand and use as a fuel. Fear is fuel. The title of Today's guest's book, Patrick Sweeney, the fear guru, who's been on before to talk about the book, returns today to talk about the audiobook version that's dropping March 1st, pre-selling now. Patrick's got a very generous offer for you guys as listeners to have the opportunity to win a couple of you guys a free copy of the audiobook by signing up for his email newsletter. We'll talk about that here in the episode. We catch up on what's been going on in the last 18 months. And Patrick has the courage to even address some of the very tough things that have been going on for him relationally over the course of COVID and quarantine. And we dig into a few of the, the, the lessons that we didn't even hit in the first episode and things that are unique to the audiobook format and content that are coming out on, on March 1st. So super excited about that and to bring it to you today. Two more things quickly before we dive in. If you are listening to this episode in real time, the day it releases, well then tomorrow we have a Clubhouse audio session live. Clubhouse, new social media if you're on there. Patrick and I will be jumping on there on Friday. That's the 26th. And we're going to do a live on fear and fatherhood. All right, that should be pretty, pretty cool if you have a chance to catch that with us. And then the one other thing I wanted to share with you guys is another review from the Apple iTunes podcast reviews. I, I really appreciate these things, guys. I, I read them. I, I value them. Keep them coming. This one is uh, from a guy, Steve Stewart, who we know here on the show. It's entitled Empowering Embodied Mastery. And he says, Michael's podcasts are outstanding and encourage me to grow personally and professionally, both horizontally and vertically, and as an integrated human being. This podcast is for both men and women, as there's valuable growth opportunities for everyone. If you're curious about learning what untapped potential exists within you and others, then get to listening. One day, one life, Steve at somaticwarriors.com. Uh, he is a, an incredible warrior and servant. We'll have him on the show one of these days. I truly appreciate him taking the time to listen and write that review as you guys do. Thank you so, so much. Keep them coming. And without further delay, let's get into this one with Patrick Sweeney, the fear guru. Yeah. All right. We're rolling. So let's just do this thing. My good friend, Patrick Sweeney, the fear guru, author of fear is fuel back to the show. Great to see you back, Patrick. Michael, it's great to be here. Uh, I can't believe it was, it was pre COVID since the last time we talked. <laughs> I can't believe it was pre-COVID since the last time we talked. Uh, it's just amazing how much has happened and, and how life has changed. Huh? Oh, it's so much, right? And, and definitely kind of a time warp. But time, you know, time does fly. I think your, your book was uh, relatively new, climbed up to number five, I think, on the New York Times bestseller. 
And now yep. you've got the audio version coming out pre-selling now for March 1st. I want to just go ahead and, and hit on that because I, I'm psyched. Uh, I, I know, you know, I, I'm more of a paper book guy, right? Like, and, and yours is always prominent here on the bookshelf. And here it is. I'm holding it up for anybody who hears the audio version of this. I'm a paper book guy because I love taking notes and I go back and I look at my notes yeah. and I, I dog your pages but some of the things I love about audiobooks, like the Goggins book to me was a must have yeah. because of the end of chapter challenges that were sort of bonuses for the audio. So you got some bonuses in the way you've designed the audiobook. Tell me a little bit about that to start. Well, I tell you what, it's, it's similar in many respects to Goggins. Um, I didn't read the book. I had a uh, former professional baseball player who's also an ESPN commentator. He and I met uh, uh, gosh, three or four years ago, this event in Martha's Vineyard. I actually made him do an ice bath with me. <laughs> At uh, Relentless MV? <laughs> At Relentless MV, yeah, exactly. There you go. That's right. And uh, so um, uh, John Kane's event, it was a super event. We hit it off. I loved his Boston accent. So Lou read it. And then I thought, you know, each one of the chapters has an interesting story, one about um, a Navy SEAL, another about the first woman F-18 uh, instructor pilot in the Navy, another one about this reclusive billionaire. And I use these examples to illustrate the neuroscience principles in the book. For, for your listeners who, uh, who have read the book, they'll know that. Um, and what I thought would be really cool in the audio version is to bring those people in. And so uh, I got 10 amazing guests who conclude each chapter with me and Lou. Uh, Lou Merloni is the guy who read it, former Boston Red Sox player. Uh, so me and Lou spending 10 or 15 minutes asking them some great questions. And we have you know, everything from this reclusive Texas billionaire who's never given an interview, given us his family secrets, like what his dad told him and, and what he told his kids to... Um, uh, you know, Mark Devine, who many of your uh, fans know and, and talking about SEAL training and the difference between what makes success and what doesn't. So yeah, it's, it was, it's really the bonus content is, is so much fun and, and so interesting. I think your, your listeners will like it a lot. So, uh, uh, so yeah, check it out on Audible and uh, Amazon, Fear is Fuel, the audio version. Yeah, perfect. Uh, we're going to get this podcast out pre-March 1. And awesome. yeah, I think you and I may do some, some live stuff between here and, and three, one as well. So I'm excited to talk further and, uh, and also the book. I love that format. Uh, yeah, certainly commander Mark divine has got a lot of, a uh, lot of great stuff on fear and, and courage. I know you guys did an Instagram live talking about that kind of early in, in COVID and yeah, in lots COVID, happened, yeah. Yeah, lots happened since then. Right. Um, let's do just a super brief kind of bio recap for folks that may not have heard the, the first time we talked on the podcast. So I'll set it up for you as, as I remember uh, earlier in life, <laughs> sure. you know, you're probably, probably still super achiever, but I would, I would call it sort of super achiever in the sense of maybe overcompensating even for fear yeah. and, and some things going on in your, in your past, whether that was through Olympic level athletics and then entrepreneur, uh, technology startups, to the point where you had, you were literally facing a, a near fatal end, a, a, a disease that kind of called it all into question and may have been the end of life for you. And then an opportunity to kind of start again and figure out maybe how to, what, what those fears were about, how to face it down and what life 2.0 was going to look like. Well, and, and, and that's just it, Michael. Uh, I had a second chance, you know, I got, I got life 2.0 and I realized how fear had just run my whole life up until then. And my biggest fear, you know, for, for your listeners who don't know was that I was terrified of flying. I saw a plane crash when I was a little kid and I missed out on so many amazing opportunities growing up because I wouldn't get on a plane. You know, I was always making excuses and always trying to build up this, this veneer, you know, kind of this cocoon to protect myself. Cause I was so full of shame and, and guilt and, you know, I didn't want to tell people that I was scared shitless to get on a plane. So I, I made up stories, you know, I lied about things and it was all just to cover up this fear. And uh, when the doctors at Hopkins, you know, I had a rare form of leukemia, uh, ended up being sent to Hopkins. And, you know, the, the doctor said, uh, you should get your affairs in order and say your goodbyes. And, uh, you know, at that point, I sort of looked back and I just felt I was just, just awash in regret. And I thought, man, if I die now, 
the memory my one-year-old daughter is going to have of me is this guy who's too afraid to get on a plane and take her to Disney or take her back to Ireland or, or whatever. And, and that would have been me. You know, it was if I had to for work or when I was racing the World Cup, these six or seven beers just to, to drag me on the plane. So when I got out, um, I decided, you know, I was going to live life uh, I was going to die, so might as well live life <laughs> and made sure I did. So the first thing I did was go out and take flying lessons. And, uh, <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, we, we don't have to go into that whole story again because, um, you know, we did on the last podcast, but uh, I went from being a terrified flyer to getting my private license, my instrument rating, my commercial rating, my seaplane license. And now I compete in aerobatics, right? You know, I fly a stunt plane and do exactly what would have just just scared the shit out of me talking about 15 years ago or 16 years ago. So it just shows you that all your dreams are really on the other side of fear. And that's the whole reason I wrote the book. Yeah. It's so amazing. It just doesn't even, you know, I, I know the Patrick now just doesn't even make sense to me, right? We're just talking off air about you spending <laughs> six or seven hours climbing a 511 uh, mountaineering route. Right. And, and like, how can somebody go up a sheer face, but they're afraid of getting on an airplane doesn't even doesn't even make sense, right? I and you're so right about the shame that builds up around that maybe downward spiral of fear and then compensating for it and overcompensating and, and lies. And it's so uh, crazy to me how we just attach ourselves to these, these past things. Um, fear. So we mentioned Commander Mark Devine. Uh, I had a conversation with him about fear being the gap between the known and the unknown. Really, really, it's, you know, what is, what is it all about? What, what's, the, what's the science behind kind of that concept? Well, you know, Michael, and that's a perfect, that's a perfect analogy or, or intro into what's been going on with COVID since we last talked. Yeah. So from a neurological perspective, for, for the book, I interviewed three dozen of the world's top neuroscientists. So I took all this information and tried to put it in plain English. And one of the most intriguing components is our mind is a prediction engine. So we constantly try and predict the outcome of every single moment. And most people uh, are, are in a situation where everything's predictable, so they're comfortable. And, and when you can't predict something and, and it doesn't align with what your mind expects in reality, we produce something called free energy. And free energy is the root of all, all fear. It's like the fuel for fear. And the way that we keep from producing free energy is if we start to take control over things that we have in, in um, our sphere of influence, and let go of everything else that we don't. So we had no control over uh, you know, the speed of the vaccine or who was gonna wear a mask or all this other stuff, but people spent their whole 2020 worrying about things that they didn't control. And consequently, they ended up, you know, they ended up freezing and, and not having. And I, I was just, uh, actually just did a podcast with uh, Commander Devine um, a couple of days ago. And I said, look, there are two, Here's a scientific fact. When a mouse is afraid, it freezes. When a leopard is afraid, it, it, it just, just dramatically, powerfully, and incredibly fast jumps into action. Hmm. And I said, what I saw over the past year working with uh, probably 40 or 50 companies through Zoom and everything else was, was population is dividing itself into mice and leopards. And the, the mice are just sitting there waiting, you know, when is 2020 going to end? Oh, shit, 2021 starting out the same. I'm going to just try and sleep through this, too. I'm going to hit snooze on 2020 and, and, you know, wait for it to go away. And other people I've seen, you know, a bunch of people I've worked with had the best year of their life. Yeah. Uh, one of my buddies is a, a CEO that I've been mentoring for a while. He's acquired four different companies. You know, he's expanded his technology and done stuff that, you know, he hadn't planned for 10 years from now. So I think people have a choice to either be the leopard or be the mouse. And they have to understand that if we're trying to predict the outcome of every single event, we won't be able to do it. And the only thing you're going to do is get yourself more stressed out, produce more cortisol, more DHEA, more adrenaline, and, and these stress hormones weaken your immune system, so actually make you more susceptible. 
as opposed to if you take action and you're doing things, then that then what that's doing is that's creating connection to a part of your brain called the SGACC, which is the courage center. And that's actually making your immune system stronger. So fear can make you more uh, resistant to COVID if you use it correctly, or it can, it can tear down your immune system. Awesome. Yeah. So what, what does this look like? I'm just trying to think a little bit about how to put it into uh, a couple contexts. So let's bring it back to COVID in just, just a second, which is, you know, yeah. so dynamic and, and, you know, I, I get, okay, fear is, can be used as fuel. I, I know I hear the, you know, hear the concept of lean into fear or fear is a great indicator of something that's important to you. And, and I agree, right? I've talked to so many people and I feel the same way. 2020 wasn't easy. I don't think it was easy for anybody, yeah. but so many people have thrived if I think yeah, they, they approached it with the right mindset and adapting their action, but continuing to take action rather than being frozen by fear. So um, life is so dynamic. So to think about how to deal with fear on such a dynamic 24 seven basis, if we boil it down for a second, right? So I mentioned to you, I, I love doing events. You love doing events. You put something on the calendar. It, it keeps you motivated. And I love like the Absolutely. big, the big scary ones, right? So uh, yeah. Here's the one. I, here's the one I've got coming up. It's been a challenge, right? Because our whole calendar got wiped. 2020. Yeah. I had 50 races planned that all went away, and oh, this year has kind of started the same way. But I had the amazing opportunity to take my son. He's 13 now, to an event a month or two ago, and it was a a manufactured 12 or so hour crucible for fathers and sons together. And nice. we're able to take these young men, these young teenagers through some things that, you know, the 12 hour day, you don't know what's going to happen. And of course it starts with designed man. chaos. So then you're thinking like, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's going to be 12 hours straight at this pace. And it's, yeah. again, it's the sort of the fear of the unknown. So I'm yeah, actually going, I'm, I'm going back for an adult event with these, with these same men that is 75 hours long. Uh, coming up here in, in less than less than two months. And and that's where, so if we, if we boil it down to an example like that, let's say, go back to the event that kicked off with me and my son and the, the men's event will be the same deal times times 100, right? Yeah. Boom, you're in the chaos. The ex, you know, Marine guy is screaming at you. You got all these hard men and you're, you're facing, you know, a, an unknown duration, unknown effort, unknown, you know, everything is Events, unknown. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, yeah. let's, let's take that little microcosm. How do you boil something sure. like that down to what you control at that point? The, the biggest thing, and yogis have been doing this for thousands of years. Everyone that we know who's a professional athlete, a professional special forces ops person, a professional fighter pilot, they all know that, um, hang on a second. I think that's me. Or was that you? I, I think that's you. Sorry, Michael. No worries. Uh, Life happens. It's going to be, it might be one of these things that uh, we have to let, let go its course here because I have no idea with Zoom going where that's coming from. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> All right, there we go. Can you, you want to set the question up again? Yeah. So <laughs> let, let's take it down to anything hard, right? Whether it's, you, you said special forces, fighter pilot, professional athlete. In my case, you know, yeah. we're, we're thrown into a, a chaotic physical event. And these manufactured physical things are a great training exercise. What can you control in those moments to focus on the controllable to deal with fear? It, so the, the very first thing, and yogis have been doing it for thousands of years, like I said, special forces operators learn it when they go to sniper camp. Pilots learn it uh, real early on to help them handle Gs, is breathing. So I talk about a method in the book called the four by four. Navy SEALs refer to it as box breathing and they do five second increments, but it's basically being able to control your breathing in any situation, because what that does is that makes space in your mind. I mean, literally. So when we get scared or when we produce uh, free energy, what happens is the amygdala, our lizard brain, the, the small almond shaped gland at the base of our mind starts to take over in this fight, flight or freeze response. When it does that, it hijacks an area of our brain called the working memory. 
and that's where we do planning, we do strategy, we, we, we can do multi-level decision making, but the amygdala takes it over and says, let's get the fuck out of here or let's, let's beat the hell out of this thing. And that's basically all it can do is, is, is that fight, flight, or freeze action. It's that one app up there. As soon as we start breathing, what happens is if we're breathing in a steady control way, we're sending information to the brain. So there's two ways the brain gets information. Uh, top down, which is the, the, your eyes, your ears, your senses, the temperature, what's happening around you. It's taking in data and bottoms up, which is your heart rate, your, the chemicals that you're producing, the, the breathing rate. So if you can practice breathing, and this is why I tell everyone they should do it every morning, even if it's just for three or four minutes when they wake up. If you practice that breathing, it sends a really powerful signal to your brain that you're not under threat. When it does that, it clears out your working memory. So now you have the chance to either be the mouse or be the leopard. So as soon as you have faced that uncertainty, as soon as you start to produce free energy, if you do the breathing, the, the, I, the four by four I do is in for a count of four, hold it for four, out for a count of four, hold it out for four. And, and just doing that steady breathing, you're immediately going to break that grip of the sympathetic nerve system on your brain. Now, what you do next is highly critical because this is where a concept called agency comes in. And agency means taking control of the things that you control. And uh, one of the guests in the audiobook of Fear is Fuel talks about this for, for, uh, at length in the book. His name's Dr. Shane Murphy, and he was the sports psychologist at the Olympic Training Center when I was there. He was a sports psychologist there for 15 years. And he said every single great athlete that he ever worked with at the Olympic Training Center has one thing in common. And that one thing that they have in common is their ability to have the right self-talk for the right moment. So once you breathe, you're in your crucible, you're thinking, holy shit, I forgot Vaseline on my feet. I'm going to have blisters in six hours. This rucksack doesn't feel good. It, it's broken. Now I don't have a waistband. Uh, you know, all the shit that starts going through your mind, that's where you're creating your worry. You're creating your stress. You're, you're creating the potential for failure. <clears throat> and if you change that dialogue, if your self-talk is, you know what, uh, the time that I got wet in that winter ruck at home, that, that was the toughest thing I've ever done. This, this doesn't even compare. It's, it's nice and warm out now. This is San Diego springtime. You know, you start to change the dialogue. It's making room to have that dialogue that then can help you decide and you determine if you connect to the courage center and you're going to be that leopard or if you let those fears and the projection of, of failure go forward in the, in the future. And that's, you know, incidentally, it's not just for a crucible event or something like that. This is what I advise people within COVID. And, and, you know, it's what I used on myself this year too. It was a, it was a really tough year for me as well, um, you know, from a relationship perspective and it's worked out really well for, for me and, you know, for my ex-wife and, and, uh, it was all because we had the courage to face things and, and, you know, not, not sort of try and put issues under the, um, you know, under the rug that might've been easier to deal with. Right. Yeah. Let's, let's get there. Um, so to kind of bridge and segue there. So uh, I, I like that a lot, right. Breathing, creating space that, uh, that hijack, I mean, the, the brain is a tool, right. It's a survival tool and it wants to, predict, as you said, these, these worst case scenarios, what might be a fatal outcome here, right? So it's always jumping to death, right? Like this airplane, getting well, on this airplane death, is going to kill death me. Or failure, right? Death or yeah, failure. It's, it's, it's death, death or failure. And the thing is, if, if we get intensely curious, if we open up that space and we start to think, hey, the world's a very friendly place. And, and I've got a belief in myself that I can do something great, like live in Chamonix, France and inspire people and spend my days, you know, out in the mountains, being healthy and, and, you know, everything else will take care of itself. Then what you start to realize is you're looking for the opportunities to succeed in, in your area of genius and in, in where you want your life to be. And this, this is what's so important to, to, for people to understand during COVID 
if you think that you've got a, this envisioned future and you're opening yourself up, you're being really present, then you're going to start to connect these dots all over the place and start to realize, hey, you know, I, I just ran into this person here and this person there. But if you're saying, gosh, when, is, when are we going to get back to normal? When can I start going into the office? When you're looking for all the reasons to fail. Right? Your, your mind is starting to create uh, its, its own bias towards failure because that's what you expect. So it's having that, that open curiosity, right? Being, being okay with the uncertainty, but just having this belief that when you observe the situation you're in, you, you orient yourself around it, you can decide, take action, you're going to get more data back, do it again, do it again, do it again. And it's all those decision loops that helps you connect the dots. If you don't get yourself into those decision making loops, then you're fucked because you're not getting any new data back. You're just in the same area and, and getting the same information that hasn't helped you in the first place. Right. Yeah. So am I going to steer my cognitive bias towards and an envision new reality, or am I going to let it continue to steer me back to where I was or maybe where I didn't want to be? Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. So if I go back to, um, let's go back to COVID then before we jump to relationships and, and the challenge of COVID is, um, so breath practice in, in yeah. daily practice. Uh, and, and I, so I just finished a, a five week breathing course that was amazing. I've done a lot of breathing stuff, but this in particular, maybe it's just right place, right time for me. It opened up a whole new level of awareness. And, and so when you say creating space for me and what I saw in the others in the, in the course, a lot of this was just creating awareness. So for example, maybe a quick morning breath practice, like the four by four you mentioned and focusing on things like making that a nostril breathing practice, making it a low uh, belly breathing practice that's moving horizontally, not a, you know, vertical yeah. breathing that puts us into fight or flight, just starting to practice those things for a few minutes a day was making everybody aware of how they were breathing the rest of their day. So they yeah. could start to get uh, agency over that. So it became a practice that permeated the day. And not only created space as a product of those five minutes, but it, but it really starts to ingrain a new habit uh, that, that affects the whole day, right? And, and it's absolutely right. And, and one of the interesting things about that breath practice is people think, oh, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to get into meditation. It's an hour a day. I don't have that kind of time. You literally, so I do five things in my morning routine and I have, you know, uh, pretty much since the, the, my Olympic training days. So for the past 20 something years now, and one thing is, is always the breathing. But if you start it literally just three or four minutes every morning when you first wake up, first I always do a gratitude practice, like thank God or thank Buddha or, or you know, thank the universe that you're above the dirt. That's number one. You got another day and you're there to you know, make something happen. Then three or four minutes of breathing, literally within the first week, it's going to change the cellular structure of your brain. So it'll start to adapt how you feel. And that's going to that's gonna affect you for sure the rest of the day. And one of the things that I told people going into COVID to do is write down everything they could affect. So everything from you know, their diet to the supplements they take to uh, when they determine focus time to how much time they're going to spend watching TV to you know, setting alarms for sitting so they're not at the, their desk or a table for four or five hours to all these things that they could do and they could control. Then write down on, on another column all the things they can't control and, and everything from, you know, the lockdowns to, uh, to delivery times from Instacart to, uh, you know, who wins the election. And then understand that their time, effort, and energy needs to go with these other things. So if they're looking at at you know death numbers or uh, looking at, at potential election results or all the things that worried people during um, in the 2020, then what they're doing is they're just wasting their energy and they're they're creating that negative focus with with the fear. If they go back to this list that they have control over, then they can just pick off things every day. And knowing that you just do four or five things every day that are in your control that are going to make you healthier, that are going to make you happier, that are going to build your relationship or your career, then you know you've accomplished something. And just having that, again, that reality, that bottoms up information that, that things are happening in your control that are good, that starts to create a path for the whole year. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the idea of a breathing practice, like you said, doesn't have to be, you sit down in the, in the sauna for an hour and, and meditate, right? Those four or five minutes, even ideally, you know, first thing in the morning, right? But then I find that I keep finding space to continue that practice through the day. And particularly when there are stressful events, right? Maybe you're sitting in the car in traffic or, you know, sitting at my son's soccer game. What else am I going to do, right? I'm sitting out in the beautiful suns, looking at the scenery and wow, the schedule got screwed up. And now we're trying to figure out if they have a game or not, or we made, you know, we made the trip for nothing. Well, I can't control that, but here's an opportunity to sit down and breathe for a few minutes. Why not? Right. And especially in, in tough or stressful or emotional situations. So, uh, you know, here's, here's an easy one, Michael, that, yeah. that I found really helpful this year doing, doing two minutes before you get on a zoom. There you go. Right. So, so if you just, you sit down, you know, you got a call, you know, I did it with you at, at, uh, three I sat down just went through a little bit, gets you present, right. You're, you're kind of clears out your mind, get, gets you focused on the person that you're engaging with. So you can be fully present for them and, and, you know, get the most out of that conversation reduces the stress, helps clear your mind a little bit. And we're on so many Zoom calls now, just saying, hey, I'm gonna do get on two minutes early before I click my camera. Just a, a few breaths like that. And uh, yeah, there's there's always room, room during the day to do something that you know is simple, but is gonna help you in a big way. And, and most people don't realize the impact of something as simple as a few good breaths. Yeah, I love that idea of, of using it to really switch gears between between things and be present and, and even dial that down to a single breath within a conversation. You know, Zoom-based relationships have their challenges. I know that has stressed things like business relationships in difficult ways. We're in this situation, at least over here, where uh, teachers unions are scared. So my son can't be back in school in person, right? They're doing remote school. We're all working from home. It stresses the whole family dynamic and then the social dynamic. So let's um, let's go there a little bit, right? Sometimes it's just a breath within a, a crucial conversation can make all the difference in controlling your emotions and having having a meaningful conversation. I know you are very close with your kids. You were stuck in Boston for quite a while before you were able to return yeah. to France during the, the quarantine, but you had a lot going on relationship-wise. How, how has all that looked in terms of, of fear, and, and breathing and focusing on what you can control and, and how that looked with your family. Yeah, so it was an incredibly tough year for, for me, Michael. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was high beta, right? As, as they'd say on Wall Street, I had this amazing launch of my book. Uh, like you said, hit number five on the Wall Street Journal uh, bestseller list and started, had all these speaking gigs lined up, you know, at, at a higher rate than I've ever had. And I thought, man, this is gonna be an incredible year. Then my wife got um, busted for drinking when um, drinking and driving when she picked my kids up from hockey practice. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, she had a little bit during lunch and didn't realize it and then came to find out that she had a real problem with alcohol that mm. had been hidden, you know, from me and really hidden from her. Started doing AA, um, you know, and, and started working on her personal issues. The whole thing hit me huge with fear, right? Because I had no idea, you know, I knew she'd have lunch with the girls, um, uh, you know, a couple of times a week, but didn't realize that, that, you know, it was more than a couple of times a week, it was every day and uh, hidden, you know, wine bottles around the house and stuff like that. And so this, this whole thing hit me, um, you know, it was a big sense of betrayal, a big sense of fear, what's going to happen, you know, what's, what's going on with, the relationship. Why is this happening? Why is this happening to me, my kids? And, you know, it was, this is 20 years of marriage and, and, you know, we never, never had any problems. Neither one of us ever cheated on each other. We never, you know, had any indication. So it was really, it was the surprise of it. And then COVID hit and I, uh, you know, we have a place here in Chamonix in France and then a place in Boston. I was in Boston for the launch uh, and did a bunch of, you know, TV interviews and people started uh, talking about fear around COVID. So it was perfect timing for me. And then I tried to come back here and, and figure out, you know, what we we're going to do from a family perspective and make sure my wife was taken care of and supported. And uh, I got refused. So I couldn't, couldn't get in. 
And so here I am in Boston, uh, you know, by myself, basically for four months and, uh, and didn't, didn't touch another human being for almost three months in that period, you know, saw some of my friends from a distance and, and uh, a lot of zoom calls and, and that sort of thing. And it was, I mean, it, it was horrific. Uh, and there were so many times during that, when I thought, man, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna go get a, a 12 pack of beer and I'm gonna sit here and watch friggin', uh, you know, Guy Ritchie movies until I pass <laughs> out. <laughs> so, so there was a big temptation for that. And, um, you know, and, and fortunately, I got a lot of great friends and, and uh, I reached out to them because I could control that. And, you know, and I had people challenging me from the physical perspective. So I got, got my rowing shell back, back out. I was rowing almost every day. Um, my son had this great routine because they, they weren't in school. So I'd wake up, uh, you know, at, at 6.30 or 7, we'd jump on a call at 8 while I was either doing a morning workout or just go out for a walk. And he and I would FaceTime every day, like, nice. which I, I think was so critical for me and him both, you know, emotionally, but also for the, the continuity of the family, right? And, right. and figuring out what we we're going to do. And Kristen and I were seeing a therapist uh, once a week, virtually, he was in New York, I was in Boston, and she was over here. And, and, you know, one of the things that, that we did is there were so many unknowns about, about, coming apart and and you know we faced all those things when i got back to to france in um july after my ted talk we sat down and and kind of looked at where we were and and i looked at my role and what happened she looked at her role and what happened and and we sort of figured out why and then uh as incredibly difficult and and scary as it was we decided that that you know creating space in our marriage separating and and taking time apart was a smart thing to do and and man that was the, you know that's a whole another level of fear for me because I'm, you know, I've been living with this woman for 20 years and what am I going to do alone? And the, the boys, you know, uh, the boys are here with me and we've got the whole house and I'm, there's renovations going on and, and, you know, I've got to now cook and, and, and handle this household of two knucklehead boys. And, uh, you know, it was, <laughs> it was so much fear coming up and so much uncertainty. But, you know, when I kept looking back on this, and this is often where I go to Michael in my world is, uh, if, if I don't love every moment that I'm in, then it's my fault, right? It, it, there's, there's, there are some things, if I understand that I can't control things, and I certainly couldn't control um, my wife's, you know, problem with, with substances, and, and then what I can control is my response to that. And that gets back to the whole agency thing. And there were, you know, there were a ton of times when, when I felt like, you know, open a bottle of wine or something like that. And instead what I do is I do the breathing or, uh, you know, I call up some of my friends and, and do, you know, some sort of virtual burpee challenge or, or, you know, let's do an Everest this week. We got to get, got to get 29,000 and 29 feet of vertical or, or something like that. And just immersing myself in things that I could control and that challenged me, right. That weren't just sitting in front of the TV, uh, you know, watching, um, reruns of, of, you know, some, some old movie or something like that. So right. I think that was, that was a big part of it. And, you know, Kristen's been very courageous as well. And in, in just sort of facing things and admitting challenges and, and controlling what she can control. And so we've both grown a lot out of it. You know, we, we see each other all the time and, and um, you know, it's, it, it's just a challenging year as, as this is actually the first time I've talked about it. So um well, thank you for having the, the courage to talk about it. it. You know, it goes back to your, your mouse or your leopard. Are you going to be a mouse in your relationship or a leopard and be courageous and, yeah. and take action wherever that, you know, wherever that may lead? Well, and, and, and that's the thing, Michael, it, it would have been, you know, relationships, even after, after six months, you know, all, all the chemicals that you get from seeing someone new and everything else start, stop being produced. So once you're in a relationship for a year, for two years, for five years, you've got all this inertia. And the inertia for a lot of people is safety, 
right? And they're, they're thinking, you know, the scariest thing some people do is leave a relationship. And that, that takes a tremendous amount of courage because you, your mind, again, is going to tell you these stories. Well, we've got finances commingled. We've got houses commingled and cars and our, our friends, you know, is she going to become your friend and he's going to become my friend? And, you know, you have all these worries. So oftentimes getting out of a situation that, you know, you might have outgrown or, or, you know, maybe you think you're a failure. So I, I got that a lot. I thought, man, how could I have failed in this relationship? And a couple of my buddies in this organization I belong to called YPO, Young Presidents Organization, they said, you know, what was your, your most successful company? And I said, well, it was Odin. They said, how, how old was it? I said, 10 years when I sold it and, you know, had that big win. They said, well, how long have you been married? And I said, well, 20 years. And they said, well, there you go. It's twice as successful as your, as your most <laughs> successful company. What a, what a great run you had, you know? And so yeah. it's the, the mindset of trying to understand why, why it's not a failure or maybe why, why a failure was the perfect thing for me right now. And they're uncomfortable and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're scary and they're, they're you know, icky conversations or thoughts to have but you gotta have them. And, and it's just like facing that fear. All your dreams are on the other side of it. So whatever comes out of it this year, me, I know is going to be the best thing for me, but, um, but it, having that faith and that belief that that's the case, I think that's, that's really what being happy in the moment comes down to versus being, you know, scared or constantly looking for the future or lamenting how great it was in the past. And right. I definitely knew I didn't want to get into that. That's the, the gap again, right? Between the, the known and the unknown. What if, what if, what about, you know, how can, but, and, and, you know, this, this temptation to just sit on the couch and have another whiskey or wine or something like that. I, I love what you're talking about of, well, really that that's the substance, right? Is it's changing your physiology. It's changing your perspective, which you can do the same thing through physical activity, right? Go change, get off the couch, do some pushups, do some burpees, change your physiology, change your perspective, and, and, and move past that thing, right? Kind of the other side of fear, as you like to say. I, I do have one kind of final question for you. I know we're a little tight on time today. You wrote the book some time ago before you hit this major emotional and relationship challenge in, in your life, in your marriage. And so I know a lot of what you've thrived on over the years has been sport activity. I've got a lot yeah. of like high achiever uh, adrenaline type of stuff that you that you talk about with others like like Mark, like the fighter pilot. Uh, do you have is there anything in the book I don't recall around relationships and, and fear and what's on the other side of fear and relationships? Yeah, there is. There's there's some some great tips and and it's it's stuff that I used, right? <laughs> you know, learning um, learning about this stuff. There's a a brilliant neuroscientist, one of my favorite guys, uh, who we also interview, named Dr. Earl Miller from MIT, and uh, he's the most he or one of his papers is the most cited um, paper in in uh, neuroscience. So he's just a brilliant guy, and he he talks about how there is no multitasking, and he explains what you're doing in your brain is you're actually multi switching. And when you do that, you're losing a second every time you try to go back and forth to different conversations and about 10 or 15% of your cognitive power. Hmm. So, so if, you're, if you're scared and you're trying to work through something, the breathing and then making sure you're, you've got no distractions. And so, you know, when my wife and I first started trying to talk through the relationship, um, we'd both sort of have the phone going in one hand, you know, be on Zoom together or or, you know, somewhat distracted by kids or whatever. And then we decided, okay, look, no, no multitasking. We're going to go into this. No uh, sitting here and, and thinking about the, the sort of what ifs or what has. Let, let's just focus on the present. So all the things that we talk about in different scenarios, and there's a, there's a story that I use in the book about um, a financial situation I got in after I sold a house I had in, in Colorado. And, you know, I was on my way to the climbing gym, got a call from my accountant saying, hey, uh, I got some bad news. You know, that $50,000 tax bill we thought we were going to have is going to be more like 200000 <laughs> and, and I was like, you, you know, the, my immediate thought was, God, I should go find a bar now and have a whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and so I pulled over to the side of the road. I did a bunch of breathing exercises. And then I just asked myself, what can I change, you know, about this current scenario that's going to serve me? And, and, and I just sat there and I was open to it. 
And I realized I'd invested in 60 different startups over the years and a bunch of them had failed. And some of them had, have done really well like Instacart and Slack, but a bunch have failed and were complete losses, but I never took the write off. So I called back my accountant and I said, hey, listen, I've had these, whatever, 10 companies, maybe more that I know have failed. Can we write those off? And she said, yeah, if you have something that shows they went out of business or you know, you're, you, you lost your money. And so I went home, dug through all my, you know, all my paperwork and stuff that I had on these different companies and got back on the line with her. And we ended up saving like $125,000, $130,000 just because I pulled over, took, took the moment to come up with this idea. I didn't even come up with the idea. I was just open to it. And all of a sudden I thought, hey, I don't know why I haven't thought of this the whole, the past three years, but now it's gonna really help me and really serve me. So there are relationship stuff, there's finance stuff in there. There's, there's things you can use. You know, I start the book, Michael, by talking about the terror triangle. And we have three areas of fear, physical fear, which you know, we all know of, emotional fear, and then instinctual fear. So the tools in the book can help you face those. And the reason I make a triangle is every fear lies on some continuum of all three of those. So, you know, jumping out of a plane might be a pure physical fear, but if you're, you know, if you're actually flying in a plane, you've got, you've got some instinctual fears about being high and some physical fears about, you know, falling to your death and that sort of thing. So the tools that, that uh, these neuroscientists have discovered that I bring in the book can be useful for, for anyone. And this bonus content is really hit a lot more of the personal stories as well. So I, I know your readers will like it. And um, I was just thinking while we were talking, any one of your listeners who hasn't signed up for my newsletter on pjsweeney.com, if you sign up before the book launches, then what I'll do and, and just mention uh, Man of Mastery, uh, I'll pick two of you and, uh, and send out a free copy of the audio book uh, if you sign up before March 1st for the uh, newsletter. So All right, little, fantastic. Little extra bonus for those who super, to Yeah, super generous. I, I appreciate that. And I, uh, I love all the tools. Looking forward to the book. I, I love that last question. You know, what, what can I change about the scenario that will serve me? Our brain is such a great problem solving tool if we just set it up with the right questions. And I'll, I'll throw one tool back your way if you haven't used this. If you you have a strong morning routine. You probably have a strong evening routine as well. If you prime your brain with the same question evening after evening, oftentimes you'll wake up with an answer after sometimes it takes a while, but your brain will solve things when it's on autopilot as, as well, like we do in flow state. There's, there's a great um, neuroscientist named Anna Byler. She used to be at MIT. Now she runs her own lab at university of Bordeaux. And, you know, ever since I met her, I've got a pen and paper next to my bed. So, uh, so she, you know, she was telling me how the me the memories consolidate at night. So we basically move them off our our uh, RAM memory into our hard drive, and we do that when we have rapid eye movement sleep. And she said, while that's going on, we can figure out things. We can start to connect the dots that will often come either in a, in a dream or we'll wake up in sort of this light sleep stage where we're kind of aware of what's happening and, and connect those dots as the memories consolidate. So exactly what you're talking about, there's a neuroscience reason for it, but that's why I have a, a pen and paper next to my bed for sure. To capture those and then you can fall back and get some more good REM sleep. Awesome. Well, I know you got to run, Patrick. Uh, we'll hook up again here uh, very, very soon, but thank you again for the time. Thank you for the courage to tell your personal story of how COVID looked. Super excited for the audiobook, and thank you. We'll try to get some folks over to your newsletter get an opportunity to, to win the new audio book, but for everybody else, pre-selling March one and uh, Patrick, thanks again. The fear guru. Mike Patrick Close, it is a pleasure as always. It's great to talk to you. Um, I'll, I'll make sure, you know, your code is on the way for the pre-order as well. So I hope you enjoy it and I look forward to your feedback and thank you all. I know everyone's time is, is busy and uh, appreciate you listening and, and tuning into the story. So uh, hope it helps and inspires some folks out there and 100%. thanks for the opportunity, Michael. Yeah, no, I appreciate you. Thank you, Patrick. All right. Thank you again for Patrick Sweeney for that time and making the time here on pretty, pretty short notice. We want to get this one recorded and out and in your hands because his audiobook is coming out here so quickly on March 1st. Again, pre-selling now. I really look forward to, to catching it. I love that uniqueness of the, the audiobook format, the bonus content, the, the audio from some cameo guests who appear in the, the topics and the, and the stories and metaphors in the book. So really powerful format. 
uh, incredible guy, super achiever himself, living, you know, as a, as a real example to all of us, just living it to the max, climbing mountains, skiing and cycling, living his dream as a, as a father and inspiring others uh, to, to greatness, as he says. So good on you, Patrick. Thank you again for your time. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you didn't read the book, get the audio book. And if you did, get this one anyway for the, for the bonus content. Make, make sure you sign up at pjsweeney.com and enter, just mention Mastery for a chance to win a copy free of the audio book. Links to Patrick's website, the Fear Guru website, his social media, all that can be found in the show notes for this episode, which are on my website, manofmastery.com slash 075 for this episode. All right, guys, that's it for this time. Keep those reviews coming. Super appreciate them. Reach on out. Uh, I, you never know where these things are going to go, right? Just had a, uh, an, another listener who stumbled across the podcast in its very early days, Chris Hoffman and his group at Rare Breed Development. We just connected I'm doing a, a session, the, have the honor of being invited into his men's group and spend a little bit of time to learn from them and with them here in the near future. So guys, uh, we're all here in abundance to support each other. We're all on the same journey. There's so much more to learn. So I, I just look forward to it and I appreciate your time and I hope you do the same. Let's get out there and get back after it.